It's Tuesday, so that means it's time for another top 10 video. This Tuesday, I'm taking the runner-up tie to last week, where we had a tie between D&D apps and lethal low CR monsters. So that means today is lethal low CR monsters. So if you want to see what those are and the rules behind it, stay tuned. Generic here there be monsters bit. <laughs> What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and let me give you my rules behind what I consider a low, a lethal low CR monster. Well, for one, it needs to be an official published in a Wizards of the Coast book monster. That does not just mean Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes, Volo's Guide to Monsters Monster Manual. This can be a monster that is also contained in an adventure module or something like that, but it has to be something officially published by Wizards of the Coast or the Watsi team. I also consider a low CR monster something that is challenge rating four or below. That's the other qualifier. And I'm omitting any uh, what I would call NPCs or specific creatures. Because if you look through the list, there are a handful of NPCs, specific characters for a specific adventure that are ridiculously overpowered for being considered something like a challenge rating zero. For example, look at, I think it's Lifferloss, the huge plant treant creature from Storm King's Thunder. I believe he's a challenge rating zero and has a slam attack that does 3d6 damage and can attack twice. It's a lot of damage for a zero, CR zero monster. Again, so that's the thing. Officially published, challenge rating four or less, not a, not a NPC or specific character to a given adventure. Number 15 is the Bloodhawk. What's that? A challenge rating one eighth monster from, I think, the Monster Manual? Basic rules. Yeah, I, uh, if you look at this thing, first of all, it's got an armor class of 12, so not great. It's got seven hit points, so its hit points are on par with a goblin or a kobold. It has a 60-foot fly speed, something goblins and kobolds don't have. It has advantage on perception checks and proficiency in perception, so if you're trying to hide from it. It has pack tactics, so if it has an ally within five feet, it's going to have advantage on its attack roll, a plus four to hit, and a d4 plus two piercing damage. I, I know that might not sound like a lot, but that's the same amount of damage that a kobold can do, except this creature can fly and can give itself pack tactics without sunlight sensitivity. Plus, they're really cool looking and like a swarm of these things attacking a low level party could decimate them if they have advantage and you roll crits. 2d4 plus two damage uh, on low level characters could be a lot and it's completely unexpected. Number 14, Skeletal Giant Owl. This is from Infernal Machine Rebuilds. This was one of the official Wizards of the Coast kind of released adventure modules. And this is essentially gonna be like a giant owl, but dealing more damage, I believe, and also being a skeleton, therefore it's a little hardier. So armor class 12, sure, 19 hit points, all right. But the key thing is it's a giant owl, therefore it has 60 foot fly speed and flyby, meaning it can fly in, attack somebody and fly out without provoking attacks of opportunity. Um, because it is a skeleton, it is immune to poison, exhausted in the poison condition. It does have dark vision out to 120 feet. It does have vulnerability to bludgeoning damage, so something to consider. But in my experience as of late, a lot of my players are only carrying slashing weapons or piercing weapons. Now, that's not to say that in your scenario it won't differ where people will have access uh, to bludgeoning weapons, but it's something that's continually plagued parties that I've been playing with. And it does 2d6 plus 1 slashing damage, and once again, advantage on hearing and sight-based perception checks, so it should be able to spot enemies. And if you can fly in, deal 2d6 damage, and fly out, again, for a challenge rating one quarter monster, in theory, this should be no problem for a party of four level one adventurers, but 2d6 plus one damage might be enough to take out a whole, like take a member down to zero hit points, a party member down to zero hit points with no problems. Plus, a skeletal owl just kind of looks cool. And again, if you play up like the whole owls are silent when they fly, this could be a really dangerous threat. Number 13, 
the giant elk. I know it's kind of weird that I'm dealing with a lot of um, animals and things up front, a lot of beasts, but a giant elk is is super dangerous. It is a challenge rating two creature. It has 14 armor class and 42 hit points and a 60 foot movement speed. So this thing can zip around. It's got a decent amount of hit points, but look at this, okay? It's got a ram attack that if it hits with its horns, uh, which has a 10 foot reach by the way. So this thing may not even get close enough to people to, for people to hit it with a melee attack. It does 2d6 plus four bludgeoning damage. But the real kicker is if it moves 20 feet towards them first and hits them with the ram attack, it does 2d6 additional damage. So we're up to 46 plus four bludgeoning damage. And if it's a creature, they have to make a DC 14 strength saving throw or be knocked prone. Again, if they're prone, attacks are going to have advantage. But if it just chooses to hit them with the hooves instead, it does 48 plus four damage. Again, challenge rating two, folks. This thing can move around. It's got a decent passive perception. Uh, the fact that it has 60 foot movement, it should have not a ton of problems to be able to move 20 feet towards a creature to deal 46 plus four bludgeoning damage on a ram with 10 foot reach. Once again, a simple hunt into the forest for a level one or level two party could go south very quickly if they take 46 plus four bludgeoning damage from a ram attack from 10 feet away. Number 12. I think it's a Periton, is how you pronounce it? Periton. Periton. Thank you, Marisha Ray. Um, so I like these creatures a lot. I like the symbolism of what they look like. I'm a big fan of that. They also have a lot of really cool lore about them. Um, this unnatural hunger to rip out creatures' hearts and eat them. Um, when a Periton uh, consumes a heart, its shadow changes for a brief time to reflect its true monstrous form. There's all sorts of really cool craziness, um, and there's like things to deal with its reproductive cycle, and it's got a really cool story. Like Their antlers can be used for different potion ingredients. It's very cool stuff. Um, but they, also like our skeletal giant owl, have 60-foot fly speed and a flyby attack. 13 armor class, 33 hit points, and they are resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Once again, a challenge rating two creature, so something you could throw at a party relatively early on. And if flight isn't a problem, which it could be at a low level, just it being able to fly away could be a problem. The resistance to non-magical attacks could also prove difficult. So it can make two attacks on a turn, a gore attack and a talent attack. Its gore attack does a d8 plus 3 piercing, and its talons do 2d4 plus 3, but it has, if it moves 30 feet straight towards a creature and then hits them with a melee attack, either or, uh, gore or talons, it does an extra 2d8 damage. So if this thing could, in theory, be 30 feet up, fly down, hit someone with their talons, deal 2d4 plus 2d8 plus 3 damage and then fly 30 feet away again without provoking attacks of opportunity again oh and then the perception on sight and smell could be useful as well and i just really like the lore around them number 11 pretty standard but it's a werewolf i mean really any of the lycanthropes can be fit in here but the fact that they are that a werewolf is challenge rating three and things like were ravens and where bats and where rats are i think even lower uh but this is the reason why right here completely immune to non-magical attacks that are uh that are not silver so again at challenge rating two or three you may be fighting these things early on and you might not have access to the gold it will take to be able to silver your weapons blades meaning you go to fight this thing and you can't kill it you will just be wailing on this thing never endingly and you will not deal a single point of damage to it with a non-magical non-silver weapon and that's terrifying especially if you happen to have a party that doesn't have a caster because while it only has 58 hit points uh, you know, you could plink away at this thing with cantrips and deal damage and blow spell slots to take this thing down. But otherwise, unless you have access to magical damage or, again, a silver or magic weapon, it is going to just take nothing. And I want to point out that contrary to what people may believe, they're not vulnerable to silver damage. It doesn't deal double damage to them. It just does regular old damage. 
So you regular a silver weapon or a regular weapon is just going to hit this thing normally, not any extra damage at all. Plus, you know, it's got the ability to change forms so it can move a little bit faster if it goes into wolf form. When it's in its werewolf form, it can make two weapon attacks or a bite and a claw attack. And this one particularly, the stat block has a spear, but its claws do 2d4 plus 2 slashing damage. And its bite does a d8 plus 2 piercing damage, plus the whole potentially infecting you with lycanthropy thing as well. Has a whole nother slew of things. And again, all that for a challenge rating 3 monster. Number 10. Husk Zombie Burster. This one is brought to you by Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, and if you've watched Campaign 2, you may have seen these guys. But the I think the Husk Zombie and the Husk Zombie Burster are, I think, both challenge rating 1. But these are different than your typical Night of the Living Dead style zombies. These are more of your 28 Days Later zombies where they are fast. Has a 35 foot movement speed, 37 hit points, only 10 AC, so nothing too crazy, and the standard kind of undead poison uh, immunity. But uh, a humanoid slayed by uh, a husk zombie revives, uh, let's see, humanoid slayed by a melee attack from the zombie revives as a husk zombie on its next turn. So if this thing manages to take you out to zero hit points and you die, on your next turn, you will rise as a zombie. So if your party, again, challenge rating one, folks, you may not have the ability to bring somebody back from the dead when they die. So if they don't get brought back, they're now a zombie on the other side fighting you. They also have zombies undead fortitude. So if they drop to zero hit points, they have to make con saves to see if they can pop back up to one hit point. And they make two claw attacks on their turn. Uh, for each of these attacks that reduce a hero, a creature to zero hit points, they can make an additional attack. So their claw attack does a d6 plus three slashing damage. So that's pretty decent for a CR1 monster. But again, they make two of those. 2d6 plus six damage if they hit with both, potentially crits in there. And if they take a creature to zero hit points, they get to make another attack for free. Again, all of those taking creatures to zero hit points cause them to rise as a zombie on their next turn. And when they die, they explode, and anyone within five feet must make a DC 12 con save or take 4d6 poison damage on a failed save, half on a success. And then the kicker on top of that, a creature killed by the explosion burst damage rises as a husk zombie after one minute. These things, again, because they're zombies, typically in our heads as DMs, we want to throw a bunch of them because they're zombies. A group of these could destroy a party because they could turn all of them into enemies or you know you finally kill them and then they blow up and deal more damage this could be an epic encounter for a group again challenge rating one even still if this thing managed to come in and get two attacks they kill it it does the undead fortitude thing and it comes back and it does another attack and then maybe they finally kill it again um and then uh, yeah, it's when it, it explodes uh, and is destroyed. Oh, it can do... I'm sorry, it can do that. I, I wasn't when it dies. That's my bad. It can choose to kill itself. That I think makes it even worse. Um, the bur I thought the burst was a retributive thing when it dies. It's not. It's an option that it can choose to do. So it can just blow up whenever it wants. So you put a couple of these at them. This is going to be a pretty, uh, pretty bad time. Number nine. Cockatrice, I had to have some sort of petrifying monster on here because, let's be honest, petrification can be lethal at low levels. The only way to cure petrification is with a greater restoration spell, which is a fifth level spell, something you're not typically going to have access to when you're, tip when you're fighting challenge rating four or lower monsters. I can also speak from personal experience in an old 3-5 game. Uh, we had, at a very low level encounter, a Cockatrice completely just take out one of our party because they were petrified and we had nothing to, we couldn't do anything about it. And we had to still keep going through the dungeon. It happened in like the third room of the dungeon. Um, so they're nothing crazy, a low AC, decent hit points so they can take a hit or two. They're only a challenge rating one half, but the kicker is when they bite, it's a D4 plus one piercing damage and the target must succeed on a DC 11 con save or be magically petrified. On a failed save, they start to turn to stone and are restrained. They must repeat it at the end of their next turn. Mind you, they are going to be restrained while that's dealing with that. So that's 
Uh, movement speed is zero. Uh, attack rolls have advantage against them. Their attack rolls have disadvantage, and they have disadvantage on dex saves. Um, so that's going on. And then if they fail at the end of their next turn, they are petrified on a success. It's over with. But again, their challenge rating one half. It's also not uncommon to throw a group of these uh, at a party. Number eight. Black pudding. I can speak to this one with personal experience, having recently dealt with one who crit me and almost killed me in a single hit. Uh, so a black pudding is a challenge rating four monster. So this is higher on our damage or our or like that's the spectrum upper spectrum. They only have an armor class of seven. They only have a twenty foot movement speed and they have eighty five hit points. They're a ooze, right? But they have eighty five hit points, so they can take a beating. They're also immune to acid, cold, lightning, and slashing damage, so just flat out nothing from those. Immunity to blind, charmed, deafened, exhausted, frightened, and prone conditions. They are blind beyond 60 feet. Um, they can move through a space of up to one inch. They have a corrosive form, so any creature that touches it or hits it with a melee attack takes a D8 acid damage. So just hitting it by itself can hurt you. Any non-magical weapon made of metal or wood that hits it begins to corrode, so you can start to lose the uh, efficacy of your weapons. After dealing damage, it takes a permanent minus one penalty. Uh, if it takes down to a minus five, the weapon is destroyed completely. Non-magical ammunition made of metal or wood that hits it is destroyed after dealing damage. Um, and it can eat through two inch thick non-magical metal or wood in one round. It can climb on all surfaces. And it has its pseudopod, which does a D6 plus 3 bludgeoning damage and 4D8 acid damage. I want to remind you that I told you me, as like a level 6 character in a game, got crit by this thing. So that was 2D6 plus 8D8 plus 3 damage in a single hit. That will take a lot of characters down at, channel, at level 4. In addition, it also deals a non-magical armor worn by the target is partly dissolved giving it a, a cumulative minus one penalty. Again, that's non-magic armor. The weapons get damaged when they hit. This can reduce it if the AC um, is destroyed, if the penalty reduces it to zero. Plus, it has the split reaction. When a pudding that is medium size or larger is subjected to lightning or slashing damage, it splits into two new puddings if it has at least 10 hit points. Each new pudding has hit points equal to half the original one rounded down. New puddings are one size smaller than the original. I want to point out that the hit points may reduce, but the damage that it does is the same. So you might think, oh, we'll just cut it in half and then it'll be easier to deal with. They'll have the split difference hit points, but each one will still do a D6 plus 3 plus 4d8 acid damage and take acid damage and you'll take acid damage when you hit it once again one of these things in like a tight corridor where you have to get past it could be really really dangerous if you can't get far enough away to hit it with range damage number seven the yellow musk creeper this was introduced in tomb of annihilation you'll also see a handful of things from tomb of annihilation appear on this list because they are lethal, as is the nature of Tomb of Annihilation. So this is a plant creature, which I thought was interesting, and it has uh, only five foot movement speed. It's challenge rating two. Um, it remains motionless. It's indistinguishable from any ordinary plant. It has regeneration, so it'll get 10 hit points back at the start of its turn unless it takes fire, necrotic, or radiant damage. Um, and its touch attack does 3d8 psychic damage, something that not many people resist. If that drops you to zero hit points, it dies and is implanted with a yellow musk creeper bulb. Unless the bulb is destroyed, the corpse animates as a yellow musk zombie after being dead for 24 hours. The bulb is destroyed if the creature is raised from the dead before it can transform or if removed, cursed is cast on it. And it can also three times a day emit spores out to a range of 30 feet. And each target that uh, must make a wisdom saving throw or be charmed by it for one minute. While they're charmed, they can do nothing but move closer to it. A charmed creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turn, ending the effect on a success. So again, this thing can touch you and deal 3d8 psychic damage to you and possibly cause you to rise as a zombie under its control within 24 hours. Challenge rating 2. Also, again, this is a thing where you could, in theory, add yellow musk zombies as options for things that would be around due to this one creature, and then that may be the full encounter. 
Number six. Man, I did not realize how deadly Will-O-Wisps are as a challenge rating two creature. So let's take a look at it. First of all, 19 armor class for a little ball of light. All right, 22 hit points, so not a ton of hit points. They can be easily killed. 50 foot movement speed, but look at the resistances, like the kind of ghostly types here, right? Acid, cold, fire, necrotic, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks, flat on immunity to lightning and poison, and immune to most conditions. Um, as a bonus action, it can target a creature it can see within five feet of it that has zero hit points uh, and is still alive. That target must succeed on a DC Constitution, DC 10 Constitution saving throw or die. Uh, if the target dies, it gets hit points. So I want to point out that again, it's if they're on zero hit points and dying near you, they can just choose to make you take make a con save or flat out die. And if you do, it heals from it. Um, it can move through objects because it's incorporeal. It can change its illumination, but it does a shock attack that does 2d8 lightning damage with a plus four to hit. Um, and the Will-O-Wisp and its light magically become invisible until it attacks or uses its consume life. It can, I'm sorry, it can use an action to become invisible um, as if concentrating on the spell and then it can attack you once again while it's invisible with advantage, potentially dealing to you 48 lightning damage. And then again, if that drops you to zero hit points, so you go unconscious, it can use its bonus action to make you possibly die and then heal itself. Plus, on top of all those resistances, a group of these things, which I feel like is a common thing, you'd put these like in an encounter amongst other things, pretty dangerous for a glowing little ball of light. Number five. Keeping the undead theme going, we have the Banshee. Yet another undead with those kind of undead resistances. Acid, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks. This one, however, is immune to cold, necrotic, and poison, as well as most conditions. It can fly with a fly speed of 40 feet. It has 58 hit points. It can detect living creatures within a region or uh, within five miles of its location. Um, its corrupting touch attack does 3d6 plus two necrotic damage. It has its horrifying vision, which makes everybody within 60 feet make a wisdom saving throw or be frightened for a minute. Um, they can repeat the saving throw at the end of their turns. Uh, with disadvantage if they can see the banshee um, but that's not the real reason here it, the real reason is the whale attack which is once per day um i can do it as long as it isn't in sunlight uh, all creatures within 30 feet must make a dc 13 con save and if they fail they just drop to zero hit points uh on a success they take 3d6 psychic damage so again challenge rating four so probably 3d6 psychic damage won't kill the party at that point but i have definitely had a higher level party encounter a banshee and fail that dc 13 constitution saving throw and go unconscious um that can be brutal especially i mean uh, imagine you're fighting this as designed right challenge rating four level four characters uh, and if you f you could have the entire party wipe to zero hit points because of one ability that this banshee uses. Number four. I did not realize how many undead I had on this list, but we've got the ghost up next. Those same resistances as the banshee: acid, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magic. Immune to cold, necrotic, and poison. Fly speed: forty-five hit points. But the thing that the ghost has going for it is the most dangerous enemy to the party is the party itself. While it does have a withering touch, which does 46 plus three necrotic damage, which is nothing to shake a stick at. Uh, and it can go in and out of the ethereal plane if it wants to as an action, meaning it can pretty much avoid damage. Um, it also has a horrifying vis visage similar to the Banshee. It's a DC 13 wisdom saving throw or be frightened for a minute. However, if you fail it by five or more, you age a D4 times 10 years. You can repeat the save at the end of your turn. Uh, and let's see, if you don't have it reversed with greater restoration within 24 hours, that aging is permanent. Um, and again, it's probably pretty limited, but if you play one of those races that like lives for 25 to 50 years or something like that, and you roll a four, you could age 40 years and potentially your character could die. That's really up to your DM, but that's an option. 
but I've definitely played with people who are like, my character's only five years away from dying. Well, this thing, it's got gotcha you if you fail by five or more. No, 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 you know, you're going to minimum 10 years aging. Um, but the real thing that will take the party out more often than not is the possession, which does recharge on a six, so it could do it multiple times in combat, because it is a DC 13 charisma saving throw. And in my experience, most people don't have a great charisma saving throw. Uh, it possesses the target. They become incapacitated and lose complete control of their body. The ghost is control it, but the party, the target is aware of it. Uh, the ghost can't be targeted by an attack, spell, or other effect except for turn on death effects. So if you don't have a cleric or a paladin, you're screwed. Um, it retains its intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Uh, and otherwise possesses the target's physical statistics, uh, has doesn't gain any of the target's knowledge, class features, or proficiencies, uh, but it possesses them until it drops to zero hit points. Um, the ghost ends its and chooses to voluntarily end its possession, or is forced out by an effect like dispel evil good, turn undead, something like that. When it ends, the ghost reappears in an unoccupied space within five feet, and that particular target is immune to the ghost's possession for 24 hours. Um... So the point being, like, if you don't have a means to turn or expel a ghost, which you won't have access to dispel evil and good at if you're a challenge, if you're fighting it as a level four character, dispel evil and good is a fifth level spell. So you're not going to have that for till level nine at the very least. Uh, and again, if you say, like I said, if you don't have a specific kind of paladin or a cleric in your party, the only way to get the ghost out of someone is to take them out and knock them down to zero hit points to free the ghost. And then the ghost could have re-rolled its recharge in the time it took you to take it out and it could just possess somebody else. I 100%, as a fan of Ghostbusters and a fan of ghosts in that respect, I 100% hate fighting ghosts in Dungeons & Dragons. They're one of my least favorite creatures to fight. Number three. You ready for Nightmare Fuel? Because I got your Nightmare Fuel right here in the Assassin Bug. Challenge rating 3. Uh, nothing too crazy on the stats-wise. Immune to paralysis and uh, resistant to poison. 55 hit points. It can fly. Uh, advantage on checks that re uh, rely on smell. Perception checks. And it makes two bite attacks uh, as a, if it uses multi-attack, which does a d10 plus 2 piercing damage. And then you must make a dc11 con save or be poisoned for a minute. While poisoned in this way, you are also paralyzed, and you can repeat that paralysis save at the end of each of your turns. But the real thing that's the kind of really bad part is the ovipositor attack, which it can do with a plus four to hit. And if it hits, you don't take any damage immediately. You instead are embedded and I guess infected, injected with 1d3 assassin bug eggs which immediately hatch into assassin bug maggots at the start of each of your turns you take a d6 piercing dam damage per maggot infesting you applying fire to the bite wound where it bit you before the end of the next turn deals one fire damage to you and kills the maggots but if you don't get to it and deal fire damage to it knowing that that's a thing before uh, what is it? Before um, the end of your next turn, they are too deep burrowed inside to be able to be burned. So if you uh, are infested with the maggot and you, you, let's see, if a target infested by assassin bug maggots ends its turn with zero hit points, you die as the maggots burrow into your heart and kill you. Any effect that cures disease kills all assassin bug maggots infesting the target. So you can cauterize the wound and kill the maggots if you know to do so, but you don't probably know to do that unless you're doing a lot of research on these things. But if not, they're so far inside you that they're just eating you alive, dealing to you potentially if you get hit with the big wet, the back daddy there of rolling a three, 3d6 damage every turn from things eating you apart. And from what I can tell, there's nothing that says it can't stick you again and infect you a second time with even more eggs, dealing more damage. Uh, and again, if this is happening amidst combat, you don't have the idea that curing disease, plus it doesn't make sense to me that curing disease would cure baby bugs inside my body. 
but that's definitely, again, nightmare fuel and a great way to just absolutely kill a party. Number two. If you've played Tomb of Annihilation, I'm sure you're familiar with the Zorbo, the koala from hell. Um, it is no crazy resistances or anything. It has a 10 armor class, maybe, but 27 hit points. It has advantage on saving throws against magic and other magical effects, but it has natural armor and this destructive claws ability, which is what makes it so dangerous. So the natural armor, it magically absorbs the natural strength of its surroundings, adjusting its armor class based on the material it's standing or climbing on. If it's on a tree or a bone made out of something made of wood or bone, its AC becomes 15. If it's on earth or stone, it becomes 17. Or if it's on metal, its AC becomes 19. If it isn't in contact with anything, then its AC is 10, right? If you've got it like floating in the air or something. But it also has destructive claws, which do 2d6 plus 1 slashing damage. Also, I forgot to mention, this is a challenge rating 1 half creature. Um, if the target is a creature wearing armor, carrying a shield, or in possession of a magic item that improves armor class, it must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, one such worn or carried item you get to choose magically deteriorates, taking a permanent and cumulative minus one penalty to the AC it offers, and the Zorbo gains a plus one bonus to its AC until the start of its next turn. Armor reduced to an AC of 10 or a shield or magic item that drops to a zero AC increase is destroyed. Let's talk about that again, okay? If you're wearing armor or carrying a shield, fine. Or if you're in possession of a magic item that improves AC. I'm going to say probably one of the most common items that improves AC would be a ring of protection. It provides a plus one bonus to all of your saving throws and a plus one bonus to armor class. But this last set says if it's the armor of the shield, um, AC of 10 or a shield or magic item drops to a zero AC increase, it is destroyed. So again, you have to pick, but let's say you're a wizard wearing a ring of protection and you're not wearing armor or carrying a shield. The only thing on you to pick is your ring of protection. If this thing hits you and you fail that dexterity saving throw, your ring of protection's AC bonus drops by one, therefore becoming zero, therefore immediately destroying your ring or cloak of protection. Again, and that's a permanent cumulative bonus. This could knock down your bracers of defense. That again, it doesn't specifically say, it says wearing armor or carrying a shield. It doesn't state that it has to be an armor or a shield that is non-magical. So this could also in theory reduce the permanent armor class of your magic shield or your magic armor. And then again, it will boost its armor class on top of the weird natural armor it may already have, possibly 19 for standing on metal. It could bump it up to 20 while it's dealing 2d6 damage to you and ruining your day. And it is challenge rating one half. Number one. Probably surprising no one. This could be on a list of lethal creatures for any level, but low CR lethal creatures, the intellect devourer, a challenge rating two creature, uh, 12 armor class, 21 hit points, resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magic attacks. If you know what this thing is, you know what it does. But uh, you can detense, detect any creature within 300 feet that has an intelligence of three or higher, unless they're protected by something like a mind blank spell. And it can make one attack with its claws and use devour intellect. So its claws do 2d4 plus two slashing damage, which isn't a, a small amount, but devour intellect is the big thing. The intellect devour targets one creature it can see within 10 feet if that creature has a brain. They must make a DC 12 intelligence saving throw or take 2d10 psychic damage. On a failure, roll 3d6, uh, roll 3d6. If the total of the 3d6 equals to or exceeds the target's intelligence score, that score is reduced to zero. The target is stunned until it regains at least one point of intelligence. We've stated this a bunch on the channel that unless you're really a character or a class that uses intelligence, intelligence often finds itself to be the dump stat of most characters in the game. So, I mean, even still, if the DM rolls really well and rolls three sixes, that's going to knock down a creature with an, eight, with an intelligence of 20 
or sorry, we'll have 18 rather. Um, so like if you're one of those characters rocking an eight intelligence or a nine intelligence, it's possible to easily hit that with 3d6. So it's stunned and then we have the all consuming final move body thief. The intellect devourer initiates an intelligence contest with an un uh, with an incapacitated humanoid within five feet that isn't protected by from protection from evil and good. If it wins, the intellect devourer magically consumes the target's brain and teleports into the target's skull and takes control of the target's body. While inside the creature, it has total cover against attacks and other effects originating from outside the host. It devour. Uh, it retains its intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores, as well as understanding of deep speech, its telepathy, and its traits. Uh, it otherwise adopts the target statistics. It knows everything the creature knew, including spells and languages. If the host body dies, the intellect devourer must leave it. A protection from evil and good spell cast on the body drives the intellect devourer out. The intellect devourer is also forced out if the target regains its devoured brain by means of wish. By spending five feet of its movement, the intellect devourer can voluntarily leave the body, teleporting to a nearest unoccupied space. The body then dies unless its brain is restored within one round. Uh, again, brain restoration is not a common spell. So intellect devourers can be absolutely... I've heard, I've heard tons of stories of people being afraid of using these. I don't think I've ever actually heard of someone having their brain devoured by an intellect devourer. So... That's my call and question to you. Have you ever used an intellect devourer in your game as a DM? If so, did it murder anybody? Did they defeat it? What happened? Or were you the unfortunate recipient of an intellect devourer's brain eating ability? I'm curious. Also, I've given you 15 different examples for low challenge rating monsters. Why don't you go ahead and leave in the comments down below your favorite under challenge rating for monster, whether it's lethal or not, and then tell me why. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you once again to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support the channel. And thank you to all of you who have subscribed. We are approaching 44,000. 50K is in sight. I have a really fun video for you tomorrow about a really cool service for finding D&D &D games. So be sure to stay tuned to the channel to find out about that. And I will see you all next time.